cycling topics that non-cyclists don't really understand, nor can they wrap their mind around. There's a few. And in no particular order, spandex. Spandex is not a word I don't think I've ever used in relation to cycling, but non-cyclists tend to call this gear, get up, spandex. They're not totally wrong. Spandex, elastane, lycra, it's all pretty much the same thing. Stretchy materials. Created at DuPont by Joseph Shivers back in 1958, this is the ideal material for cycling these days, and has been for a very long time. But I think a question that comes up a lot from non-cyclists as to why. It is pretty revealing. It's not like we're a bunch of immodest people. But ultimately, I think it comes down to comfort. You don't want something baggy or something that's gonna capture the wind when the ultimate goal is for you to carve as small a space as you can when you're riding the bike to mitigate the impacts of wind. Ultimately, we wanna go faster, so punch a smaller hole in the wind. You want something tight, you want something that's not gonna flap around, and when it comes to shorts, you certainly want something that's not gonna move around the, um, the region and create chafing. You definitely don't want chafing. Call it what you want. Spandex, Lycra, Elastane, it doesn't really matter. But yes, it needs to be form-fitting, it needs to be tight, and it needs to be comfortable. The shaving of our legs. Now this comes up a fair bit when you have a discussion with a non-cyclist as to why do you shave your legs? It is a good question. So in the past, I've used the argument that hairy legs create more drag. I'm sure there's some empirical data somewhere that shows that you can get more watts if you do shave your legs. Mm. When you get to my age and my category of cycling, I don't think it really matters all that much. The other argument I've used is that if heaven forbid you fall off your bike and have road rash, having the hair matted in that area can lead to more infection and the healing process will be impeded somewhat by that matting of the hair. I think that is true for the most part, but ultimately I think it comes down to aesthetics. Road cyclists for the most part have always shaved their legs. Does it matter if you shave your legs or not? No, I don't think so. Now, if you are gonna shave your legs, Keep going. <laughs> Don't stop at the knee and look like a hamster. Go all the way to the top. But if you do shave your legs, are you a shaver just for the summer months or do you keep it going all year round? Let me know in the comments below. Cycling stuff that non-cyclists typically don't understand or have questions on. And this one's pretty important. Cost. Why are bikes so expensive? Why would you spend over $20,000 on a bike. Why do carbon wheels cost so much money? So there's a few things to unpack here. Yes, you can go ahead and spend over $20,000 on a bike. Sure, you can do that, it's available. It's just like you can go and spend over a million dollars on a car. It's there, it's available, someone's gonna do it. Do you need to spend $20,000 on a bike? No, of course you don't. Is the bike industry a little out of touch right now with its pricing? Yeah, 100%. But if you can afford to do it, why wouldn't you do it? I think the common refrain is when someone says, well, you spent how much on a bike? I could buy a car for that. Sure, you could buy a car for that. But would a $20,000 car give you as much satisfaction as a $20,000 bike? And the benefits of being outside and riding a bike? Hmm, that's debatable. And again, you don't have to spend $20,000, $15,000 or $10,000 on a bike to enjoy the benefits of cycling. You could spend a couple of hundred dollars. I don't have a problem with people spending $20,000 on a bike. If you can afford it, knock yourself out. Riding up mountains. Some non-cyclists I've talked to in the past have a hard time understanding why on earth you would ride up a mountain when you could certainly drive up it. I've seen bumper stickers on the back of cars saying this car has been up Mount Washington, somewhere like that. This car has been up Whiteface in New York. Well, congratulations to that car. Riding up mountains is very much a part of road cycling history. It's very much a part of cycling lore. And I think ultimately it comes down to human nature. We all set challenges for ourselves, whether that challenge is getting up at five o'clock every day for a week, 
Whether or not that challenge is going to the gym five days a week, well, that's a challenge. We all have different challenges. Sometimes it's good to have those, and sometimes it's good to set goals for those. So why wouldn't you challenge yourself to ride up a mountain on a bicyclette? Sure, it's going to be hard, but we set goals, plan accordingly, train accordingly, and try and complete those goals. The sense of accomplishment once you reach the top of that mountain is really euphoric. Last one. Things that non-cyclists sometimes have a hard time wrapping their head around. Basement miles. Why, why on earth would you spend one, two, three, four, five hours in the basement riding on Zwift or Train a Road or whatever program you have that you're using to stay fit over those long winter months. And I'm mostly talking about cyclists who live in a climate where the winters are um, pretty savage and you're forced, somewhat forced, to ride in the basement. Now, of course, you can go outside and ride in inclement conditions. You can go and ride on a fat bike. You can go skiing and do all those wonderful things outside. But I'm talking specifically about you who like to ride in the basement as opposed to doing those other things. So why oh why would you go ahead and do that? Ultimately, I think it comes down to fear. Fear of losing your fitness. And when spring rolls around, you don't want to be that person that says, ah, I wish I had done just a little bit more. Because the ramp up to regain your fitness from the previous summer is so much harder if you don't do the base miles in the basement over the winter period. I've done it before. I've backed off in the winter just thinking I can hold a baseline, get to spring, and then regain my fitness. It just takes way longer if you didn't do a little bit of work in the winter to prepare yourself for the spring. Trying to regain your fitness in the spring when the conditions aren't great, the roads aren't great, it just kind of sucks. We've all been there. Fear. Fear of losing my fitness. Now, there is the possibility that you're going to lose a little bit of fitness, a little bit of top end power, but you try to mitigate that as much as you can. Ultimately, you want to hold on to as much of that because you work so hard to gain that high FTP. You want to hold on to it desperately. 